Good morning and welcome to St. Thomas's Episcopal Church. I am Terry Quinn Gray. First, giving honor to the Lord Jesus Christ and heartfelt thanks to Father Howie, Father Juan, and Deacon Cecily for this special opportunity to be here today. And second, if I may, to dedicate today's message to the memory of Mrs. Ethel May Finley Quinn my beloved grandmother, who would have celebrated her 100th birthday today. The gospel opens with Jesus's baptism in the Jordan. As Jesus is coming up out of the water, immediately the heavens open up and a voice declares, you are my own dear son, I am pleased with you. Then Jesus doesn't pause to bask in his glory, but immediately is driven forth to the wilderness in preparation to work on himself and to fulfill his earthly mission to identify with us, you and me, and all of our imperfections. Also, the theology of water is woven throughout today's scriptures and speaks volumes to me personally on how water can be like threatening, like giving, like preserving all in one. The passage helps me to see how my lived experience during the early days of COVID was truly transformational. It feels like my life has been like a watershed, particularly over the past 12 months. For me, the initial stay at home order caught me off guard as I struggled tremendously with what to do with the extra hours now available due to no commute and more flexibility with my work schedule. I suddenly had more time, so I took on more stuff rather than covet the time for rest and self-care. I resisted fiercely, primarily out of guilt, until I had no choice but to embrace the fleeting window to rebalance or risk burnout. That assumed short moment of rest and rebalance evolved into significant opportunity of restoration and reflection. I started to get out of my own head, out of my own way and debunk deep seated fears about changing careers in the midst of a pandemic. For several months, I sat among doubters, folks who did not know me, who did not honor all that I thought I could give. And I had to hook on and be obedient to a few angels that nurtured me day in and day out. Long story short, by God's grace, I'm starting a new gig in a few weeks and super excited about it. God is good, amen. Furthermore, I acknowledge for the first time the loss of my grandmother who died a little more than three years ago. I cried that gut kind of ugly cry for the first time since her passing. My channels with Miss Ethel were reopened and I was instantly reconnected to her example of living by faith, not by fear. She always told me that I was highly favored by God. So be bold and live into it. I know that COVID has been and still is difficult for a lot of folks. It's been for me too on occasion, but more a silver lining than anything. COVID time has been clarifying and re-energizing. As a card-carrying introvert, I have mostly enjoyed the social distancing and the time to reconnect with my Lord and Savior and with myself. Key point is that true transformation, cultural, social, starts from within with you, one individual at a time. I highly recommend let go and let God. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Miss Ethel, for being steadfast in my corner. So imagine just about three months into COVID, my, I was really into my new ritual of recharging and rebalance. And then George Floyd was publicly murdered in eight minutes and 46 seconds by white police officers in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was hard to unsee what we saw and now see. I was immediately restless and catapulted 
back into that wilderness, angry, scared, confused, dangerously cautious, tempted. Folks of all persuasions and backgrounds took to the streets despite social distancing mandates across the globe in mass protest about the injustices that Black people have endured since our arrival in America as slaves in 1619. I didn't march in the streets this round, and I even declined initially to participate with internal networks on the job and within the community. My emotions were too raw and too unchecked, and it took me a while to discern between the authentic commitment from lip service. After much prayer, I eventually re-engaged with a renewed attitude and was rolling strong by mid-June. Remember Father Howie's sermon from a few weeks ago where he called out that you eventually have to come down off the mountain to be amongst the people and do something. For the record, things haven't eased up. Instances of murder, brutality, profiling, and attacks on people of color are still happening in record numbers. Workplace diversity and inclusion ranges from spotty to dismal, and churches are still among the most segregated during the worship hour. On top of that, the recent insurrection on the U.S. Capitol was perhaps the most blatant civic display of white supremacy and privilege since the 1960s. This well-orchestrated scare tactic worked quite well to keep the rich rich the poor, poor, and the majority silent on fighting for what is right for all people. So it's not surprising that some of us are raging. Others are fearful for our lives and our children's lives. Today, as much if not more than 60 years ago. So how does our current reality parallel with today's gospel in which Jesus after baptism is immediately drawn by the spirit into the wilderness? to be tempted and tested by Satan. Do you think we're being tested right now with this triple threat of a pandemic reckoning with social injustices and economic crises? What would Jesus do right now? Based on what we've learned or relearned over the past 12 months, are the mass protests enough? Are our fervent prayers alone sufficient? How many panel discussions, food drives, and laptop donations will it take to end poverty, homelessness, and inequitable education in America? Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. All of the above are necessary, critical, and appreciated. I'm saying there's more to do as God's people in order to tackle the root of the systemic injustices before us. There are those of us, right, who are saying, about time you see what I see. And there are those of us who are saying, how did I miss this my entire life? And there are those of us who are saying, I still don't get it, or I don't want to get it. The truth is that many of us don't know what to think right now, much less what to say. So let's give ourselves permission to pause for reflection and discernment. Engage and lean in to honest conversations that may very well be uncomfortable at first. Those conversations will get easier as we build and rebuild trust with each other. Plus be mindful that we Christians have a ton of conversation starters at our disposal. And we find ourselves at a loss in times like these. Learn to do right seek justice, encourage the oppressed, Isaiah 117. Speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and needy, Proverbs 31, nine. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him, Isaiah 30, 18. We're coming to understand our whiteness and blackness and the privileges and marginalization that comes with that. Race itself is a man-made construct with no scientific basis. We're all being told a lie. We've been told a lie for a very long time. This compels us to talk about race, racism, race relations, 
when we would really prefer not to do so, particularly now in the height of social unrest. However, we must get proximate with each other and welcome the uncomfortable conversations to make progress as humans. No need to be afraid about saying the wrong thing. Let's dialogue and share our stories. This is the first step on a prayerful journey to dismantle racism and other systemic injustices that haunt us in nearly every nation where we work and live. Otherwise, we're destined to repeat and pass on through the generations to our children and grandchildren, the mindsets and behaviors that have denied our collective progress as a people for more than 50 years now in America. Give yourself the permission to pause, to create sacred space, to consciously choose how you want to respond to today's situation. I ask that you commit to action and don't leave this work, God's work, unfinished. After all, we got here together and I'm hopeful we can move on and rise together. Despite our storied and complicit past in the church, faith, faith, organizations are our best shot at embracing our shared community. I think God is sending signals. He's putting the wilderness right in front of us on mass media right now. We the church are well poised to be the epicenter of this heart and hard work to uplift all people in a holy and sustainable way. In this Lenten season, Let's be mindful that to repent means to redirect, turn around towards the Jesus way. Repent goes beyond feelings and prayers. Are we responding as Jesus would? Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news and saying the kingdom of God is near. Believe, O oh Lord, make haste to help us. The Jesus in Mark's gospel is acting with fierce urgency. He's crossing the lines and standing up and speaking out, knowing it's risky. He's a voice for the voices throughout the gospel. What's stopping us? What's stopping me? What's stopping you for living your baptismal covenant into and out of the wilderness and turning to the way of love for all people? I'll close with pres a presiding Bishop Michael Curry's view on turn, T-U-R-N, which for me is repentance in action. Pause, listen, and choose to follow Jesus. Like the disciples, we are called by Jesus to follow the way of love. With God's help, we can turn from the powers of sin, hatred, fear, injustice, and oppression toward the way of truth, love, hope, justice, and freedom. In turning, we reorient our lives, our common lives to Jesus Christ, falling in love again, again, again. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. My name is Larry. I'm a racist. And I think that my journey of self-discovery and recovery from racism began here at St. Thomas's. I was born in 1944. I was raised in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And yes, I went to a Jesuit high school in Maine <clears throat> where we did minstrel shows and we had blackface. And nowadays people say, oh, we thought no nothing of it or no one thought anything of it. But that of course was not quite the truth. Well, it happened also in the late 50s that we have the beginnings of the black civil rights movement, uh, which was focused on more substantive issues like school desegregation and busing and public lunch counters and, all, and civil right, uh, voting rights 
uh, and a whole series of other things. During the 60s, there developed another rights movement for women. And then later in the 60s, there was another rights movement for gays. These were three major rights movements, civil rights movements that dominated in many ways the public politics of the 60s. I did not get much involved in all of that. I was in college and then I was in graduate school. And then in the later part of the 60s, I was also in being pursued by my draft board in Maine, which wanted to send me off to Vietnam to die. <clears throat> so I was preoccupied. I didn't get swept up in all of this. I didn't sort of think of all of this as in some way affecting me. In 1970, I was lucky enough to get a job here at the University of Delaware, which I have held on to ever since. In the 1980s, there developed a movement to commemorate the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who had been assassinated in 1968. And the response of the University of Delaware administration was a curious one at the time. And that was to have this as a holiday for the staff of the university, but not for faculty and students. And I wondered about that. I thought perhaps this is some kind of acceptance of the fact that many of the black people employed at the university or staff, and but not faculty and students, and therefore, in a way, this did not apply to them. My response to this whole situation was interesting in retrospect, <clears throat> and that was I had contempt for the administration in doing this kind of half gesture, this kind of hypocritical response in which, in effect, it said, okay, we'll give the blacks off, but it's not something for us on the faculty or students. Otherwise, I did nothing, and I thought nothing of it until about 1990. And around 1990, a minister who was in the entourage of Martin Luther King Jr. named Vincent Harding was invited to come to talk to us at St. Thomas's about Martin Luther King, his work, and his memory. And the way that he talked about Dr. King got me thinking, because he pointed out that although King had started off focused on issues of racism, what he had really come to focus on was the whole issue of poverty in the United States. And he said, it was this concern with paying attention to poverty, its causes, and doing something about poverty. He said, that's re really what got Dr. King killed. And I don't know how he put it, but he started me thinking about my response about five years earlier to the administration's hypocritical policy in response to the beginnings of this holiday for Martin Luther King. And what I realized, to my horror, was that I had been engaged in us versus them thinking. In other words, what I thought was Martin Luther King is a hero, a saint for them, the Blacks but that he really has nothing to do with me. And it was only five years later that I came to realize <clears throat> what a racist I had been, that I had lazily and unquestioningly gone along with the policy of the administration. I had accepted it. I did basically what they told me to do. I didn't question it and it didn't occur to me, either to give the students a day off or somehow or other to address the memory 
of Martin Luther King and to say he was a hero, a saint for all of us because we're all in this together. I had not realized until that moment that I had been going along with the position of the ruling class in this country, in this case, the ruling class of the university, which what wanted conveniently to put Martin Luther King over there in a corner and <clears throat> let him be a hero for blacks. And I think that was the decisive moment in which I began to deal with my own quiet, passive acceptance of racism, my going along with everything and not questioning much of anything. I think the next moment in my revelation was about five years later. And that was when a group of women at St. Thomas's <clears throat> who were interested in theological questions, raised the question with the clergy about whether we should start referring to the Holy Spirit in a new way. We referred to God the Father and God the Son, but traditionally we always referred to the Holy Spirit as He. And their question was, Shouldn't we have some balance here in the Trinity? Shouldn't we perhaps talk about the Holy Spirit as what you might call a feminine principle? <clears throat> and to start calling the Holy Spirit she, especially in the public recitation of the Nicene Creed. Well, for those of you who were around at the time, you may remember that there was a fair amount of controversy about it. <clears throat> And the rector wisely decided to hold a public meeting about this whole issue. And instead of trying to preside himself, called in an outsider to listen to what people had to say. And I was there, our daughters were there. And I listened to what people were saying for 45 minutes or something like that. And what they were all expressing was their feelings one way or another about this whole issue. And at this point, I had a moment of illumination. Some of you may remember that back at that time, people sometimes wore little bracelets that said WWJD or WWJT. What would Jesus think or what would Jesus do? And it occurred to me that that was the relevant question to ask on that, that occasion, not what we felt, but rather the more proper question for us as Christians was, what would Jesus do in this circumstance? What would Jesus have us do instead of just expressing our feelings and then being done with it? That too was a shift in my thinking. A few years later, in adult education, we were talking about the seven deadly sins. Now, this is an old list of seven deadly sins, which many people have had to memorize in the course of time. It is a list which is about 1,500 years old. It goes back to the fifth century AD. We talked about it, and in the course of it, I, I raised a question I had had and that was, why isn't lying one of the seven deadly sins? Isn't it really, very often, a deadly sin with which we harm others and, of course, help ourselves? We talked about that, and it was in the course of this dis stimulating discussion that somebody raised another question. Do you all know about the seven deadly sins drawn up by Gandhi early in the 20th century, the seven, the list of seven social sins. I don't think I had ever heard about it before. Somebody raised the question, so we investigated this question. And it was in the course of this very interesting, wide roaming discussion that <clears throat> one of our members, Jim Strickland, who was himself black, and a, an old member of the congregation 
said something which hadn't occurred to me before, and that is, if we're going to revise the list of seven deadly sins, shouldn't racism be on the list? And I think we all agreed. So we were now prompted to think about racism in a more open and direct way as of itself sinful. A few years later, in 2002, I happened to be in the hospital. I had a burst appendix and a bowel resection. I spent 19 days in the hospital. And one of the people who came to visit me was somebody known to some members of this congregation right now, Bob Cortvalesi. And by way of conversation with Bob, whom I had known since I had come to St. Thomas's back in 1982, <clears throat> I, I said to him by way of conversation, you're an engineer, aren't you? And he said, yes. And I said, what kind? And he gave me an answer which I had never heard before, in which he said, mediocre. And I thought, good heavens, he's actually grading himself as an engineer in this conversation with me. And it really sort of shook me up. And it came to affect my teaching later on of Reformation history, which I had been teaching since the 1970s. In the 1970s, when I started teaching it, I said that I was baptized a Catholic and educated by the Jesuits. Then I happened to become an Episcopalian in 1982. So in honesty with the students, I would tell them about this background of mine but later, after 2002, as a result of this conversation with Bob Court Vallesi, <clears throat> I took a more honest kind of approach in which I told the students, I started as a Roman Catholic, I was educated by the Jesuits, I'm a practicing Episcopalian, but when you come right down to it, if asked, what kind of Christian am I? I'm not going to necessarily rely upon the nice boxes Catholic, Presbyterian, Lutheran. Instead, I began to say, really, when you come right down to it, as a Christian, I think I have to grade myself as at best mediocre, really, because I know what Jesus calls us to. Always doing the next right thing, always being kind, always doing more than what one is doing. So now when I teach Reformation history, this is what I tell them. Catholic, Episcopalian, mediocre. And in the last 20 years, when we've had so much upheaval in this country, which has grown in intensity in the past years in particular, what has become increasingly clear to me is how white this culture is, how racist it is, but also something that I haven't talked about quite directly, and that is the problem of men in this culture, particularly the problem of white men, and particularly in a way the problems <laughs> caused by older white men, like people in my generation. I have concluded that when people accuse us, especially white men, of being racist or sexist or being guilty of something or other. Instead of talking back, what we need to do is to shut up and listen. In fact, I have concluded that men, especially white men, need to shut up and listen for the next 50 years or so, not say anything in reply, because the problems of racism and sexism in this country, which we have manipulated to our advantage in one form or another, decade after decade, for the last 50 to 75 years, actually for the last 400 years, these problems keep coming back again and again and again. <clears throat> And it reminds me of a dictum among historians. 
and that is change is inevitable. Progress is an option. But that even when there is progress, it tends to be three steps forward, two steps back. Never take any kind, any kind of progress for granted. Women and Blacks know that perfectly well. They have to keep coming back and fighting again and again and again. And what we men need to acknowledge is that the central problem is men, white men in particular. We need not only to shut up and listen, we need also to turn our attitudes around and to begin to work positively, to help others, to change this color, culture, to improve it, and to bring America to the high and noble ideals which it professes to believe in. Thank you very much. <laughs>